I'm like, what? Such a bizarre thing, what a weird thing. Life coach teach you how to live? That's insane, I've never heard something so stupid. That's essentially what NLP is. It's like being given a manual for your brain. It's not like it was just all a bed of roses. There were dark periods, there was depression, there was self-doubt. I was so unhappy. Driving on the highway, the pulse just beating in my arm for some reason, it's just really high. I remember thinking, you know what, if I just turn the car this way, I can end it and I'll just be at peace. I don't have to feel this angst. I wasn't feeling loved by my husband. I wasn't feeling respected by my husband. It was just awful and I was just saying, I can just end it right now. The thing that really stopped me was that if I was to end it now, there would be no evidence that Alia ever existed. So there was this guilt and shame. I realized it's because my life was so superficial. Don't focus on trying not to drown, focus on learning how to swim and keep your eye on the riverbank. Look, this is human nature, that we want to feel bad. You have to do everything because it's going to take you to heaven. My daughter suddenly stops and she becomes really quiet. And then she goes, you know, mom, you used to be such an angry person. And it broke my heart. I clearly took it out on them. But also I had that sense of joy that they could see the difference. The keys to a happy relationship is compassion and generosity which then breeds trust and love. Who are the allies who are helping younger women to grow on the world stage? Assalamu alaikum, I am Zainab Faisal and welcome to another episode of Her Story. Today I have a very interesting guest. She is the CEO of Dynamic Communications. She is an NLP master trainer. Thank you so much, Alia. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm excited Ab to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, Alia, when I read about you, I saw your company's website and uh, online social presence, actually. You know, I found it very interesting. The concept of NLP was very interesting. Uh, a lot of your guests, uh, you know, their comments were that NLP changed their life. So, if you can just tell me a little bit about NLP. What is it? So, in a word, I would, I would call it magic. <laughs> But really what NLP is, it stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. And um, it looks at the relationship and interconnectedness of how we think, what's going on in our mind, conscious and unconscious mind, the words we use, and our behaviors that create our outcomes. So NLP looks at how we create our reality. And in NLP, we're not so interested in what your reality is, but how you're creating it. And thus, you can change it um, with the tools and techniques and capabilities that NLP shares, that the, the, the subject of NLP shares. You can change elements to be able to get the outcomes you want. It's a very funny story. I was in Sydney, Australia many years ago, and I, was, I just finished a training, and I was going home in a taxi and kind of tired, you know, brain dead. I'd been working all day, so I was just like, you know, I just wanted to switch off. And the taxi driver just insisted on wanting to talk to me. Just one of those things, you know, and I just, I wanted to switch off. And he's saying, so, oh, what do you do? And I kind of tried to explain NLP to him, but, you know, I, anything I was saying wasn't really making much sense to me. And so he's listening to me, and he goes, ah, so it's like having a manual for your brain. I'm like, oh my God, that is such a great description. I said, I'm going to use it from now on. So according to the taxi driver in Sydney, that's essentially what NLP is. It's like being given a manual for your brain and thus being able to run your brain to its uh, maximum and most capable capacity. How interesting. Because, you know, that is the one thing uh, that we all are always trying to figure out. We're trying to figure out ourselves. We're trying to figure out our responses. We're trying to figure out the person sitting opposite to us, their responses as well. And I think for me as well, uh, and people that I usually talk to, that's where they're trying to understand their current reality. Mm. And through a lot of our communication which is verbal and non-verbal. Mm. So very interesting. Alia, later on, you know, we are going to discuss NLP in detail. Mm. But right now, I also want to know, what were your dreams as a child? Did you, did you aspire to be into the field that you're right Not now? Not at all. I had no idea about this field at all. I was just a regular kid. Um, I can't say, you know, there's some children who have, um, or adults as children had big dreams. I was none of that. I was just a happy-go-lucky kid who wanted to just have fun and play and, you know, took life for granted. And, you know, when I look back, you know, there's Oscar Wilde saying that youth is wasted on the young. 
I was definitely one of those young. Um, if I were to do my, my childhood again or my youth again, I would do it very differently. Um, but at the same time, um, I think what I did have and still have is a love for life, is a zest for living. And, um, and I think that that makes a difference. And it's something I've, I believe I've passed on to my children. Um, I definitely live by it too. I sort of, you know, people say there's, there's this meme on, you know, on social media of this, you know, these old women and they've got this bright um, uh, eyeshadow and, you know, the big glasses. I said, that's going to be me when I'm, I'm 100 years old. <laughs> I'm going to go into my grave having completely lived my life fully. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so good to know, actually. So... Alia, tell me one thing, you know, you grew up as a very happy, go lucky, fun loving kid. Then you did your um, bachelor's degree from where, Pakistan or Australia? So, um, happy, go lucky, yes, but also um, there were dark periods, you know. Um, it's not like it was just all a bed of roses. There were dark periods, there was depression, there was self doubt, there was um, issues around self worth. Like I said, I was a middle child, middle child syndromes of, you know, feeling like you're not quite here, not quite there. There was all of that. There were problematic relationships. My mother and I, though very similar in many ways, had a problematic relationships in many ways, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't, it wasn't an idyllic, it was, I mean, it was just regular, right? It wasn't like there was any abuse or anything, but we, we, had, our, we had our issues. I mean, I did, you know, school here, I went to university in Australia. Um, and I've been between the two countries. My father, my husband's Pakistani. Um, we got married here. Um, our kids were born here. We moved back to Australia. Um, so it was a it, it it was a bit of a meandering journey to NLP. I had never heard of it. And in fact, what had happened was we were living in Dubai, and um, my husband had a great job. We were living the life, the Dubai life. We were living in a fantastic part of town. We had, you know, we had the Dubai life that everybody aspires to. Yes, absolutely. And um, and I'd been working originally, and then you know the, the the company actually folded. So then there was there was no work, and my children were young, and I was wanting to get a part time job, not a full time job. And there's a whole lot of challenges, and I was so unhappy. I was so unhappy, and. I used to just sleep all day. I would, um, I, you know, the kids would, I'd go, I mean, I'd wake up in the morning only for the kids to know that they had a mother. And the moment they were in school, I'd come back and I'd sleep. And I'd only wake up to go and pick them up. And then, um, and then I'd come back and they'd be doing whatever and I would just faff around the house, really. And I mean, had a maid, etc. Um, and I, I remember these friends of mine who I met because we, I moved from Australia mm -hmm. to Dubai and these friends were like, Ali, what's happened to you? You used to be so vivacious, you used to be so full of conversation, what's happened to you? Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know. I feel like every human being is, bro is given a certain quota of words and I feel like I've used up mine. I've got nothing to say to anybody and I don't have the capacity to take on anybody's um, words either. Um, and so this, it was just, it was a very, very dark period of my life. My relationship with my husband was in a mess. I was an angry, unhappy person. I wasn't, you know, I was, I was unable to, I, I'd go to organize, I'd go to sort of gatherings or networks or events. And, you know, people say about Dubai, there's every type of nationality and it's Absolutely. so dynamic. And I'd go to events and I'd see all these people having these amazing conversations. I'm like, wow, oh, they look so interesting. Oh, they look so interesting. And I'd go and I'd have a conversation and everything was gray. Everything was great to me. Um, and I was just beside myself. And I remember this one day I was driving my designer car. And um, I was driving on the highway. And I remember thinking I could just, I could feel the pulse, my blood pressure, the pulse just beating in my arm for some reason. It's just really high. And um, I remember thinking, you know what, if I just turn the car this way, I can end it and I'll just be at peace. I don't have to feel this angst. And um, I wasn't feeling loved by my husband. I wasn't feeling respected by my husband. I wasn't feeling uh, uh, was low self-worth, self-value was low, wasn't doing anything with my life. It was, it was just awful. And I was just saying, I can just end it right now. And the only thing that stopped me was two things. First thing was that, OK, well, my husband will move on. Life will move on. My kids will be affected, but they're young. They'll move on. The thing that really stopped me was 
that if I was to end it now, there would be no evidence that Alia ever existed. There wasn't even a ripple for a life lived. I couldn't bear how surface and superficial life was for me, how I was living it. Yes. And, and that was one of the issues in, when I was in Dubai, is like, you know, you, I, you know I'd, I'd see there's so much hardship, you know, when you go to Dubai, there's, you know, you, when you're living the good life and you're like, what am I complaining about? I've got everything in mind. My husband used to say that, what's wrong with you? You've got everything. What is it that you don't have? What's, why are you so unhappy? Mm. I could never answer it. And it's like, you know, well, you have all these people who are living really hard lives. You have laborers in the heat. You have, yes. you, know, it's, you know, and so there was this guilt and shame. And at the same time, it's like, I should be grateful. And at the same time, this sense of, I'm just so unhappy. And um, if I realized it's because my life was so superficial. It was so irrelevant. So the fact that whether I was alive or whether I wasn't, made no difference. And that was a horrible, horrible feeling. If it hadn't been for that period, I would not be living the life I'm living today. Um, and as they say, you know, if you want something, it's the, it's the challenges, it's one of the things I say in my trainings as well, is that the, it's the curveballs in life that are the gifts from the universe, gifts from God. And it's when you engage with these challenges, they take you to heights that you will not be able to get to otherwise. And how long was this period that you experienced? So, I mean, we went to Dubai for a few years and then, you know, my husband was being transferred, so he went elsewhere. And we decided that at that point that we were going to take the kids, I was going to take the kids back to, us, back to Australia. And um, they were about to enter high school. and. To be honest, it was actually a bit of a trial separation. We, I wasn't really sure whether the relationship was going to survive. Um, I wasn't, you know, so he was going his way, I was going to go my way. So I went back to Australia with kids who were about to, you know, end of primary school, junior school, going to high school, at a stage in my life where I had no career, I was 100% dependent on my husband um, and financially, and I didn't know whether I had, a, I had the security of a marriage to support me and my kids, and he wasn't even in Australia with us. And um, terror, there was, it was absolute terror. I'm sure. And I'm sure. Um, I remember talking to a friend of mine, and you know, God sends angels when you need them, and she, was my, she is still my angel. Um, and uh, I was like, you know, I, I know there's nothing wrong with me. I don't, need, I don't feel like I need therapy, but I'm just, I'm so frustrated because I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help myself. I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to do stuff. I just don't know what to do. I feel stuck. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just need somebody to tell me or direct me or help me figure out. Yes. And so she said to me, Ghazali, you know, there is such a thing as a life coach. I'm like, what? Such a bizarre thing. What a weird thing. Life coach teach you how to live? Mm -hmm. That's insane. I've never heard something so stupid. And she goes, isn't that what you're asking for? I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. It <laughs> is. <laughs> anyway, so I did the research. And uh, I, you know, I needed something that was going to be, I was in Melbourne, I needed something that was going to be Melbourne based because I had kids, I was a single parent essentially. So I found a place, an institute that was uh, holding these trainings for coaching, for life coaching. And so, you know, I signed up and it was just, you know, it was that moment of just backing myself, having faith and just like, you know what, I've got nothing to lose kind of a thing practically. And so I just plunged into it. And in the process of that, discovered NLP. Because okay. NLP is the science, essentially, behind coaching. And, uh, and so, and then it was, you know, I just fell in love. NLP is, is, like I said when I started, it's magical. Because it's, we're not committed, with the moment you learn about NLP and you, and you learn what NLP has to share, you no longer are held hostage to your story. And your story is no longer the reality. Yes. And you realize you're creating your reality and you can create a different reality. And it's just, um, yeah, it, it changed my life in immeasurable ways. If you go a little back, Alia, you said that, you know, you came into NLP mm. um, and life coaching as well. Mm. But before that, you were... Um, I think into marketing, as I understand. I was in media. 
you were in media, yeah. okay. So I used to, well before that, I used to uh, work for Pakistan Business Update, mm. many like in the 90s, okay. um, a long time ago. And, um, and then, uh, you know, we moved with the kids to Australia, I was working in radio. Um, and then we moved to, to Dubai, mm -hmm. and I was working uh, with the Times and the Sunday Times newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, at that time, we were we were we were publishing the newspaper, so we, I was actually in marketing there. And um, yeah, and then that it didn't fold, but you know the company that you know it, the company folded, yeah. and um, and so that was the end of my. Um, that was the end of my career, really. So, and you were always, you always wanted to have a career all your life, or was it that, you know, up till the time I get married, I'll have a career to keep myself busy, and then I'll have a family life, because a lot of mm. people have this thought. Mm. And a lot of, you know, my guests, even in our groups, when we talk about, people are always women, especially. Mm. They're quite nervous when they step into a married life. Mm. They always wonder, how they go to manage two roles together yeah. at the same time yeah. of a wife then later on as a mother and also their career together yeah so you know how did you so yeah i mean i think because my father's expectation was that you know all of his children he's got a son fine but his two daughters would have would uh, have careers because he was very much like, no, as a, as a woman, you need to be able to be financially independent. You need to be in a space where you can take care of yourself. You're not 100% dependent on your husband. Who knows what happens? And I grew up that way. I never thought it was any big deal. Um, I mean, as an adult, I realized that that was actually not the norm. Yes. And so I didn't actually work for a lot of my marriage, but I did as well. It was, you know, it was a bit of both. And, um, but there was never an expectation, even from a husband that you should work or you shouldn't work. It was entirely in, up to me. And so it was interesting when I was in my NLP career and I, in my training period, and um, I remember I was just, you know, I used to constantly beat myself up as, you know, where, what have I done with my life? I've messed up my life. I, you know, the, all my, where I've, what I've achieved and my education and all the opportunities I've had and look at where I'm at and I should be here and I should be there and I should be at this capability and or here, you know, just constantly beating myself up. Yeah. And, um, and then I had this epiphany, this moment of realization. I had the privilege of bringing my kids up and um, because I didn't need to work. Mm -hmm. And I, I, wo I, I worked when I chose. Mm -hmm. And some women, you know, like my sister worked throughout. I, I worked when I chose. Um, and, um, and so I had the privilege of bringing my children up. And now that they're at an age, I had the privilege of working. Mm -hmm. And that thought just shifted my emotional state. And suddenly, you know, and I was struggling before that, even in, in NLP, I was really struggling with everything, building anything. And that just, that thought shifted something major. And it just, things started flowing so much more easily. And I remember this one night at dinner, my children and I, we were sitting there having dinner and uh, we were laughing about something. And we, that was a time as family, we'd come together and we'd have a, you know, we'd just chat about the day and stuff. And um, my daughter suddenly stops and she becomes really quiet and um, I'm kind of turn and look at her and I was like, what's going on? And she goes, you know, mom, you used to be such an angry person. Oh. Yeah. And my son, who was younger, he's like, yeah, yeah, you were, mom. And um, I looked at her and I'm like, yeah, you're right. I was. And it broke my heart because I clearly took it out on them. But also I had that sense of joy that they could see the difference. Mm -hmm. That yes, there was a time when I was angry and I was unhappy and I was, you know, rage was just beneath the surface. And it's not there anymore. Alia, that's quite a remarkable journey and an emotional one as well. And coming to this, that way your children are re seeing your, you know, metamorphosis. Mm. <laughs> We experience नहीं कर पाते अपनी lifetime में और बहुत anger, resentment सब कुछ रह जाता है। तो मुझे थोड़ा सा ये बताइएगा कि अगर जैसे मुझे ये change आपकी story में ऐसे लगा कि life coaching के जरिए आपको ये change आया आपके अंदर, you know, you, you went into life coaching and you started studying and training for it. How as a life coach 
do you is it my question is do you embody that and then you impart it naturally you start viewing with a different lens how does that go all of that yes um, I mean NLP the the fundamentals of NLP um, <clears throat> help us to be so much more resourceful um, in how we make meaning and so like I was saying earlier is you know people are are committed to their story Bihai bichari mein ya bichara mein, or, you know, whatever. We, we, we have a story, we have an experience, whatever's happening externally to us, and the way we experience it, we think is reality. Mm -hmm. And so that's the meaning making we do. But with NLP, we are, we are able to, as you said, have a lens through which we can actually create more resourceful meanings. Mm -hmm. And thus, choosing how we show up, being able to have the power of choice, we talk about concepts of freedom, right? And freedom fundamentally is taking ownership for where you're at mm -hmm. and taking for responsibility for where you want to go or what do you want. And the moment you take responsibility, ownership and then responsibility for where you want to go, what it does is it, it opens up choice. And that concept of having freedom leads to well-being. Mm -hmm. And so when people often talk about freedom, they talk about, okay, I just want to be free of everything. But that's not freedom. That's just maybe a momentary moment. But true freedom lies when you take ownership and you take responsibility. Then the sky is the limit. You know, this is a very different and opposite concept with a lot of people that they experience. They mm. say, Ke if you're taking ownership, we are taking ownership, we are taking ownership, we are taking ownership, we are taking ownership, So in this case, mein jab, you know, number one, वो किस तरह के लोग होते हैं जो आपके पास आते हैं यूजुअली हु कम फॉर एनएलपी एंड आई एम श्योर के हम सब कहीं ना कहीं एक विक्टिम माइंडसेट में होते ही हैं वी आर देयर वी हैव इट आई थिंक इन योर सबकॉन्शियस और योर कॉन्शियस थॉट सो हु आर दोस पीपल हु कम एंड अप्रोच यू फॉर एनएलपी रियली गुड क्वेश्चंस सो वी हैव अ वैरायटी ऑफ पीपल बिकॉज़ आई मीन आई डू लाइफ कोचिंग आई डू मच लेस लाइफ कोचिंग नाउ जस्ट लेटिंग पीपल नो आई डोंट टेक मेनी क्लाइंट्स आई डू मोर रिलेशनशिप एंड आई डू अ लॉट ऑफ लीडरशिप बिकॉज़ आई हैव ट्रेन सो मेनी पीपल टू बिकम लाइफ कोचेस देयर्स अनफ अवेयरनेस नाउ वेयर पीपल रियलाइज दैट पीपल व्हेन यू गो फॉर कोचिंग इट्स अबाउट यू वांट अ डिजायर्ड आउटकम so may is um, in my work in my relationship in my life in my health in my spirituality in my whatever i'm not experiencing what i'd like to experience or i'm not getting the outcome i want to i would like to have you come to a coach and a coach will help you figure out so the people there's enough awareness now one of the examples i give is say you're drowning in a river and you go to a psychiatrist a psychiatrist will give you medication and you'll take the medication you'll feel better until the medication's no longer working right so there's lots of research to show that once your body normalizes to medicine then you need to up the dosage or you need to have stronger meds or something so you haven't stopped drowning you just weren't feeling it until you do and then it's like well pump more meds in you come to a, you go to a, a a therapist or a psychologist and you'll get real understanding of why you're drowning but not necessarily how to help yourself you come to a coach a coach will say there's a river bank right here let me teach you how to swim so don't focus on trying not to drown focus on learning how to swim and keep your eye on the river bank that's and now this concept i think has become more familiar to people and so people who come for coaching are people either they've had enough of therapy and by the way, therapy and coaching work well together right they're a very good partnership because there is processing that some people need and so but people who come to coaches are people who are tired of that old thing and they want to now they want something new they want something else and they're looking for coaching is a space when people are looking for answers that's essentially when people come to coaches alia tell me one thing you know we spoke about the victim mindset mm. and i always ask this question how how do we come and become become our victim mindset hum bechare kaise ban jate kyu ban jate kya ye human nature hai ki hum bechare feel karna chahte what is it how do we because you meet so many people 
and I also often ask myself when I meet somebody and you know you are able to see that this person is feeling sorry for themselves. So he says, "Does your childhood have any such, you know, the way you are raised? Is it because of that? Yeah, is it because when you are living life, you are living it's the surroundings make you what happens? All of the above. It's different for different people. Okay. But, but the key element is um, the beliefs we hold, the values we have, the stories we tell ourselves." even if there have been experiences we've had. It's the, the experience, an event is just an event. The experience of it is the meaning making we do. Our beliefs, our values are created from this meaning making and this meaning making is influenced by our beliefs and values, which then influences our sense of who we are. Now when we, you know, we also, uh, we adopt, we unconsciously um, take on beliefs and values from my environment, so from a very young child, from very young childhood. So when we have, um, I mean, there's so many beliefs that um, go around, you know, culturally. If you suffer, then you will go to because that's going to take you to heaven, right? Yes. And so there is a belief that by suffering, that you to be an all suffering woman or a wife or whatever, that you have to put everybody first before yourself. To put a woman to put herself first is to be, or to prioritize herself in any way, is to be a selfish woman, is to be an arrogant woman or whatever. These are beliefs, mm -hmm. right? And so all of these chip away at a sense of a woman, mm -hmm. uh, of, an, of a human being. And here's the thing, you know, we talk about this expression, you know, it's, you know, you pour from your jug into the cups and you have to fill your own jug before you can fill the cup. But the quality of what you fill your jug with is going to influence what you're pouring. So if you're pouring, if you put your jug with, pork, with dirty water, you're going to be pouring dirty water into the cups Absolutely. of your children and your families. Absolutely. But if you're the water you're putting in your jug is clean and, and, and full of you know, nutrients, that's what you're transferring. This is very controversial. But in terms of, so there's a lot of research, first of all, to show that when you educate a woman, she will educate her family. Absolutely, yes. When you educate a man, he will go out and he will earn and he'll bring the money home mm. to take care of his family, but not necessarily educate. But if you, get, if you educate a woman or a girl, she will grow up to educate her family. Yes. And so when you have educated families and children who are being educated, it grows. You develop a more educated economy, society, etc. right? Now, when you subjugate women, they're the ones who are bringing up children who are going to be subjugated more. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I see so many people in, in, for relationship coaching and on, you know, these social media platforms of women complaining about men and husbands and being mistreated by the in-laws and being mistreated by the husband and on and on and on and on and on it goes. Mm -hmm. And that will only change when parents stop prioritizing their daughters' marriages over and above their education. Because initially, even when you look at sociologically, you look at the purpose of marriage, and you go all the way back to time immemorial. The sociological reason for marriage was safety, protection, right, for a system. Now, marriage doesn't necessarily um, mean that. Main protection, yes. Anymore. And so more and more people are getting divorced etc. So how do you protect your daughter? You protect her by being able to give her the tools and techniques, the capability to be able to help herself no matter what. Mm. What then happens is you don't have women getting into marriages because they have to get into a marriage for whatever, social norms, protection, Societal whatever it is, pressures well. societal pressures. Mm. Now you have women who are able to stand on their own two feet. And what that does is, when you have an empowered woman, empowered womanhood enables empowered manhood. Wow. When you look at all societies that are doing well, women are equal parts of the societal structure, of the economic structure. Absolutely. And you know, part of this podcast is also to encourage more women to be part of the decision-making process. Yeah. 
and that can only be done actually yeah. if the woman is empowered yeah alia you said you are a relationship coach yeah. right what sort of audience number one comes to you? is it more women i'm very interested are yeah. there more women who come to you or are there men in my coaching um i have equal measure men and women excellent men actually like the coaching process more um than from what i've heard from therapy in my relationship coaching um it's a mixture of the husband and wife um so they both come okay and and then the mixture is like we have group sessions of husband wife with me and also one on one and the purpose of uh relationship coaching and that you know and there are some key stories that is just r- rinse repeat that many people over here are experiencing um but one of the key elements within that is empowering women to develop their sense of self that is individual their own sense of individualism um which then frees and of course working with the man as well in different ways of showing up in a, in a more resourceful way um it enables the vibrational level of of the relationship to increase alia tell me what are the number one um you know problems that come to you uh, for relationships in terms of relationships and are they changing in the past 10 years there was something that right now they're different so have the problems changed as a relationship coach yeah. um or is are they the same in, in places like pakistan uh, most marriages are uh, arranged marriages and while arranged marriages has its value um one of the key elements is not taken into consideration is how well the young man and young woman get along mm-hmm. and so when they get into the marriage uh they start their marriage they maybe don't get along very well and they have a very hard time developing a connection so that's one of the issues and now this and so by the time they come to us come to me they've had many years of un, of not healthy habits that have developed in terms of how they engage with each other mm-hmm. the other reason that the main reason people come is that there's been infidelity mm-hmm. more often than not it's the man who's had an affair or had multiple affairs mm-hmm. um and that's what's brought them into the room so there's a trust issue there there's a lot of other issues there and again that's also connected into the fact that they may be not getting along very well mm-hmm. now then it's about helping them develop strategies to be to develop a more meaningful respectful relationship where they can both sometimes you know because we have arranged marriages or people have come together because they them naturally haven't come together in themselves and even in love marriages it happens that um, but they don't have the it's not easy to leave so like well how do you develop a respectful relationship mm-hmm. and studies actually show that the key to a happy marriage or key to a happy relationship is not love it's not that's not the number one the keys to a happy relationship is generosity mm-hmm. compassion and generosity which then breeds trust and love and you know if i would say gener- generosity and compassion you know mujhe ek uska ye example ye lagta hai when you give each other the space to be yeah. themselves yeah how would you define generosity and compassion in any relationship yeah and nicely especially said, this nicely one. nicely said it's it's not just in intimate and husband wife relationships in all relationships misal ke taur pe man comes home from work and the wife is nagging right mm-hmm. now a husband will fight back oh my god she drives me mad and the wife will fight back that oh he doesn't pay attention to me it's like wait hang on hang on stop you have to think about what's the positive intention well i actually and we ask them to ask if to think about the others oh she's wanting some she's wanting attention she's wanting love she's wanting some of my attention she wants something like love from me to show her love and she and she is like oh his intention is that he's tired and he wants some time out so when so generosity means that we can see that we are forgiving in terms of understanding of there's more to the story than what's at the surface and so when we come from this mindset that okay we are both we're both we're not competitors in a in a in a ring we're actually dry, we're on the same we're on tandem bike we're both on the same bike and we're pedaling together and so i'm going to help you because me helping you helps me and as you help me i help you and we together help each other to grow something more that's a mindset of generosity and so in terms of when uh, you know researchers have studied 
uh, successful relationships, one of them is mindset of generosity, is shared values, it's, it's shared experiences, it's how they speak to each other, how they're present for each other, how they listen to each other. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things are what creates a dynamic of love. Absolutely. You know, when you um, give this example of when the husband comes home, so a few days back, I was talking to one of my team members, you know, mm -hmm. a newly married kid, and I said, um, so what do you think, you know, we're talking about um, both the genders and who talk more. And, you know, they were commenting that, you know, women talk more, women talk more. So I, I asked him, I said, really, do you feel that about your wife as well? He said, yes, I come home and she keeps on talking. Bas baate kare jayegi, kare jayegi. To ka, phir aap kya karte ho? Laga, bas apne aap ko bata di. Main, hmm, haan, sun nahi raha hota main. Aur main bahut bore bhi ho raha hota. But mujhe ye pata hota, ye shuru yaan se hogi, khatam yaan pe hogi. You know? And Alia, I didn't have an answer to that. And I have so many times that the man says, the woman says, the woman says, the woman says, and we are just tired, we have to listen to anything. So, how do you work that so, out? That's the interesting that thing you talk about. It's something we call masculine and feminine energy. Right? Mm -hmm. And all human beings are a mixture of masculine and feminine energy. Right? Um, a resourceful, they say, a, a sort of a healthy, uh, heterosexual male, a man, is 60% masculine energy, 40% feminine energy. A resourceful, healthy, heterosexual woman is 60% feminine energy, 40% masculine energy. And toxic masculinity and toxic femininity is when a man just completely kills a feminine energy and he goes into just 100% masculine because that is a violent, aggressive energy. And a toxic femininity is when it's just 100% feminine, it's hyper, you know, like hyper helplessness and victimhood and all is that kind of energy. Now, when we, so feminine energy, if, if masculine energy is a projection, feminine energy is a reception. Mm. When women talk, and yes, women do talk more than men, it's a masculine energy. Mm. And what they're needing is for the man to receive. And so in those moments, what men will often do is they will shut down. They will either run away or they'll become the boy, boy-like, and run to their mother or some equivalent. Or they will just shut down. And that energy has nowhere to go. And that's what creates a toxic spiral of two competing energies now. Because a woman in that moment say, uh, is thinking, whether she's doing it consciously or otherwise, is thinking, my man, my husband, is not there for me. So I'm going to have to protect myself. Mm -hmm. And that's when the problems start coming up. Mm -hmm. And it's not like women expect men to fix their problems. Mm -hmm. They want to know that their person is receiving of them. And the projection of male energy is actually more violent. Mm -hmm. right? Now, where, so when a woman is talking, and a man's just like, well, I'll just shut down and I, I'm just going to put up an unconscious wall. The woman knows that. Mm -hmm. And all she's all at an unconscious level is he's not there for me. I will not be able to trust him. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to step into more and more into my masculine energy to protect myself. Oh. And so it becomes a, a conflicting situation. So men complain that, oh, woman's talking, talking, oh. Mm -hmm. And... The thing they need to be worried about is the moment the woman stops. Because the moment a woman stops talking, what it's saying is, I don't trust you. You're not, you're not my man. And so even though she might be in the relationship, she's actually checked out. And so while men are like, oh, but it's like, if she's still talking, she's still trying to make an effort. But the moment she stops, She's checked out of the relationship. She might, she might not be allowed to or be able to leave the relationship, but emotionally, mentally, she's checked out. As a trainer, I'm sure a baggage to aapi bhi aata hoga. How do you deal with that? And I'm asking you this question because kai log ye aspire karte hain ki hum is tarah ki um, field mein aaye, which is service to humanity. Actually, mm -hmm. NLP or you may kahongi service to humanity yeah. hai. So, you know, how do you I would say protect yourself or um, equip yourself to deal with all this um, sadness and trauma. Having my own life is important. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the main thing is 
that you don't let your ego come in the way. It's about service to humanity. And so um, as a mindset, it's not about me. I'm just a vessel. I've learned something. It's on me. Alia's not the person with all the knowledge. I'm, Alia's not some wise person who's whatever. Alia's just trained and has capabilities that she's developed and she passes on. Mm. And so it's not about me. And that's one of the elements of how you protect yourself, that it's not about me. I'm, I'm a vessel that can help people help themselves. Alia, one more thing you mentioned, ki, and you spoke about women in leadership. And you mentioned this fact that you know all our lives, women usually or generally, are conditioned in a way to follow the rules. And then when they come to you and um, take, I think, a proper scientific method to learn leadership, you know, what are the things that you tell them to work on? When I talk about um, women leadership in the corporate sector, there are what we call intrinsic issues and extrinsic issues. Intrinsic issues are internal states. What are the mindsets? What are the beliefs? What are the limiting beliefs that stop women? What are the cultural paradigms? As I said, a girl's been brought up from the moment she was born to be chup uh, karna uh, uh, You have to behave in a certain way. You can't, all of this stuff. They're told to obey, 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 obey. And I was like, now step into leadership. How? What does it mean? Right? So that's intrinsic. There's also extrinsic, which is what is the environment? Who are the, who are the mentors? Who are the allies? Who are the feminist allies, as we call them? Who are men and other women, empowered women, maybe who, women who've gone further in their journey? Who are, the, who are the allies who are helping younger women to grow? Who are normalizing women's voice, who are normalizing women taking up space on the world stage. One of the key disenablers of women uh, being, able, equal, being equal to men in terms of being able to show up is transport. So, um, you know, a woman, like a man can get a motorbike, a man can get on a bus, a man can ride a bike, a man, what a, men can do a lot more in this environment than women. So just that disenables um, uh, them from being able to work. Uh, babysitting, all of these types of things. So what are, uh, you know, and so the, as, a, as an organization, what are some things that the organization is doing to help women? Thank you, Alia. My a pleasure. fantastic fun piece to of advice. Here. Thank you. And um, I think speaking with you was, as you said, unlearning and relearning <laughs> and learning. I think I did all three in this conversation with you. Thank you. It's and, been a pleasure. Uh, I really, I think I'm very, very grateful for you to give us this time and uh, share your knowledge with us. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I love what I do, so I love to share. If you like our episode today, so please like or comment. Don't forget to subscribe. We will be able to have more exciting, insightful conversations. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.